to get your heads around some of the things I'm going to be talking about here. Now, there are a lot of typologies of citizen science out in the world now, and they're all good, and they were all come up with for different reasons. This isn't even really a typology. This is just a simple way of casting, classifying or categorizing types of projects. And we'll very briefly describe each one starting with data collection. Well, I already showed you eBird. But eBird is obviously not the only data collection citizen science program out there. There are hundreds and hundreds of other ones. One of my favorites is the Modern Fire Monitor, which is run out of the University of Minnesota by a professor named Karen Oberhauser. And for this project, there are thousands of people, mostly in the eastern and middle part of the country, that are monitoring milkweed to try and find out about the changes and distributions and numbers of monarch lobby to get a handle on the population. And to help understand that practices that are causing milkweed to decline are causing monarchs to decline. The data collection citizen science programs are not just about animals. There's also a lot of them about plants, too. Here's one called Nature's Notebook, which is a phenology program run by the U.S. National Phenology Network, which is part of the U.S. Geologic Survey in which thousands of people are gathering data about phenology, which is the timing of events in nature. When are buds blooming? When are leaves changing color? When are birds nesting? These are data important to understand a lot of environmental changes, including, of course, climate change. But data collection citizen science is not just about organisms. It can also be about inanimate things, like precipitation. So the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, which started out as the Colorado Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, is the, one of the largest projects in the world right now where people are gathering precipitation data at rain gauges in their houses, in their yards. And those, that information is being used to do early um, predictions of storms and flooding. Now, one of the things that ticks me off, there aren't too many, but the people at lunch today, we push a couple of buttons. <laughs> um, one of the things that takes me off is this thing that I see in the newspaper all the time about this new thing called citizen science, where the public is actually gathering usable data. And isn't this awesome? And thank God for the internet. But you know what? These guys didn't use the internet. <laughs> and I would, I would tell you that, um, that Aristotle was the father of citizen science, in my opinion. I don't remember, I wasn't a social scientist or a historian. I forget when he was born and when he died. But I really think that the idea of anybody with a brain being able to observe the world around them and draw conclusions goes back to Aristotle, maybe even beyond. Five points for anybody who can mentally can say what painting is. The School of Athens. Very good, very good. Very good. This is an insect in the School of Athens. But as the years went by and science became professionalized, the idea that you couldn't participate in science unless you had a degree became more and more prevalent until it got to the point where, in some cases, kids are actually scared of science because they think that you have to have a, a white lab in you know, lab to be a scientist. That reminds me of a funny story. This is the wrong time to tell it. Just because I'm afraid some of you might be starting to fall asleep, I'm going to tell it right now anyway. So we were doing an evaluation of one of our classroom projects. You know, pre-post, we ask people a bunch of questions before they do it, you ask them questions again after they do it. One of the questions that we asked these kids was, would you want to be a scientist when you grow up? And of course, after participating in citizen science, they're all supposed to say yes, even if they said no. So this one young girl, fifth grade, wrote no. And she wrote, there's a reason why, because scientists always die before they find the answers to <laughs> She did learn something, though, didn't she? But the idea that people could band together and collect data, um, even 100 years ago, when we started to come together, lighthouse surveys put together by the American Ornithologist Union in 1880 where lighthouse keepers were urged to keep track of the birds that were crashing into their lighthouses because they were attracted by the lights. 1890, the National Weather Service started a cooperative observer program, which is still going on today. In some cases, the rain, the weather stations are in the same families and ranches and farms that they were in 1890. In 1900, the National Audubon Society started the Christmas Bird Count, which was again a very famous early, early start to the idea of 
thousands of people banding together to collect information about an organism to make sense about its distribution. But the internet did enable a different kind of citizen science. When the internet became fully functional, and we started gathering images from the Hubble Space Telescope and from other different ways of collecting information through photography and other kinds of environmental sensors, the kind of citizen science that I call data processing was enabled. And this started with Galaxy Zoo, which probably most of you have heard of. But the idea is that if you're an astronomer, which I am not, I think the stars are cool if I can you know, point out the Big Dipper. Um, but if you're an astronomer, you want to understand the classification of galaxies. And the Hubble Space Telescope sends back millions of these issues of these images, but they need to be categorized, and it would take a graduate student the rest of the year or like to do it. So the folks at this program called Zooniverse said, well, let's see if we can get the public to help us categorize these images coming back from the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. And it was so successful that in a few weeks they had done what it would have taken scientists years, decades to do. And that gave birth to uh, the Zooniverse platform and a whole lot of other data processing projects. Um, like um, the Snapshot Serengeti, uh, Old Web, all of these different programs where people are trying to make sense out of all of these images. And they published. And another way that volunteers can get involved in doing data processing that I really think is cool is by helping to annotate the millions, probably billions, of specimens that are in museums all around the world that don't have the correct information digitized. They have old, um, labels that are stuck on them. Somebody has to go in and get all that information associated with the, with the specimen and onto the computer so it can be used by scientists around the world. And this is being done really, really successfully at this point. But there's another kind of citizen science in my, my buckets here um, called community science. Um, and this is also not new. The idea of community science is people coming together to try to solve a problem, usually of more local significance or interest. And a lot of times, community science projects are really born from the community. It's people who suddenly realize they feel sick, they're being poisoned, there's something wrong with their air or their water. And they say, what can we do about this? And they might reach out to scientists to try to help them gather data that they can use to a regulatory agency. Water quality monitoring goes back decades and decades, and it's been very successfully employed. Uh, in terms of gathering data to, uh, for example, designate trout streams as, as state or national trout streams. And more recently, a lot of different watersheds have gotten together and gotten people to come together and study a lot of different organisms on one particular watershed to try to understand more about that area. So the idea here is that it's a local program, a local project, where our citizens are reaching out and saying to the scientific community, please help us gather data that will have integrity that we can take and get some changes made. I have a couple of examples um, of some outcomes of those just in a little bit. And then another kind of project would be a curriculum project. Now a curriculum project could actually be a data collection project, could actually be a data processing project or a community science project. But I set it aside because curriculum projects are opportunities for a leader to engage very intensively with a group, whether it's in school or, or out of school, whether it's a classroom with sixth graders or whether it's a Boy Scout troop or a 4-H group. The opportunity to take one of these citizen science projects and actually build lesson plans around it in a very organized way, even adhering to national standards, whatever they may be at the time. So one example is bird school. Um, which was founded, funded by the National Science Foundation um, for us to build um, a curriculum over eBird, originally over Feeder Watch and then over eBird. Another good example is Driven Discover from the University of Minnesota, which is a curriculum built on that monitor, on the monitoring program. And some curricula are not built on a parent program like eBird or the monitoring, monitoring program. Sometimes it's just a really good curriculum put together by um, educators working in conjunction with teachers or other informal leaders and, and really coming up with something that, that works to, to try to have the kids learn some particular um, targeted objectives. So those are, those are four different kind of buckets or ways of thinking about citizen science just so that we have like the field in front of us so we understand what, we're, what it is that we're talking about. 
And when we move on to talk about the potential to transform science and society. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this transformation in terms of three buckets, increasing scientific knowledge, informing science and conservation policy, and for those of you at lunch, see the splash, know the splash, <laughs> and achieving educational outcomes. Citizen science projects can do all of these things. And one citizen science project, if designed correctly or appropriately, can do all three of them. Not all citizen science projects have to do all three of these things in order to be successful. If a citizen science project sets out to increase scientific knowledge of it, but so it's successful, whether or not it teaches anybody anything. If a citizen science project starts out to teach people something, and it does so, it's successful. Even if it really increased scientific knowledge, as long as it has scientific integrity, as long as it's real science. And not all projects are designed to inform science and conservation policy. So there's no rights or wrongs here. So back to the monarchs again. I, we were talking over lunch about early experiences that that, at least in my case, really galvanized my interest in the environment. One of those was a family camping trip in Smoke Hole, which I think is in West Virginia. And we were sitting and having lunch at the picnic table, and all of a sudden we got into the middle of the migration of butterflies. And it was like, wow, man, I didn't know butterflies migrated. It was just so exciting. And I've loved butterflies and I've loved monarchs ever since. There are a lot of monarch projects, not just the monarch, but the monarch project. And results from these projects have allowed scientists to discover where the wintering grounds are and to understand population and migration dynamics and to understand how butterflies interact with crops and we have a very important pollination service to the point where this new book published last year by Cornell Press could not have been published without citizen science data. It might have, but it would not have been as rich and robust as it did because of so much of the information comes from people participating in citizen science. Last year, uh, some folks got together to begin to do one of the first analyses, kind of field-wide analyses of the impact of data collection for this science project. Um, this is actually, the, the history of this is really pretty cool because the group of people that put this project together was a graduate student uh, class run by a, a professor and assistant dean of the environment, Julia Parrish at the University of Washington. And she does a graduate class every year, and she said, okay, um, class, let's find out what the impact is of data collection citizen science. There have been some more that have happened since then. This was the first one, though. And these students looked at about 400 projects, which they gathered from different databases of citizen science projects. And in these 400 or so projects, they found there were over a million volunteers, and that they had contributed two and a half billion dollars if you were to actually have paid them with the data they collected. And that 12% of these projects were contributing to peer-reviewed publications. Now, that may not sound like a lot, except you have to remember that not all citizen science projects are designed to contribute to peer-reviewed publications. And sometimes when they're in their earliest stages, there aren't yet enough data to do so. So the idea that there were already over 10% of these projects contributing was pretty amazing. And actually, the number of peer-reviewed publications based on citizen science data that are coming out are astronomical. If you don't know about Google Scholar Alerts, you should know about Google Scholar Alerts. So you can go in and you can set Google Scholar to search on the internet if you want. I have it set, in my case, to search uh, Google Alerts. I have it, it, it searches Cornell University and science education, but it searches citizen science to get that quotation through. And so every couple of days, I get a list of all of the papers that have come out on citizen science over those last couple of days. You should try this. It's unbelievable. And it's really comprehensive. It finds you theses. We recently published a white paper for, um, on behalf of the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. It's on their website. It's a Google Scholar one day to find that. It's really, really comprehensive. And you can really see just how fast these, these publications are rising. And it's not just in you know, backyard magazines. It's in top, top journals, very top journals, um, including bioscience, 
um, which I'll call out especially because bioscience has long been very friendly to um, citizen science. The editor, Tim Beardsley, is very interested in quality papers about citizen science. I am the citizen science subject editor for, for bioscience. And just today, we accepted the most recent article on citizen science, which will be out in the May issue, which shows how eBird has transformed something called GBIL. And eBird data are actually beginning to fill in data gaps in countries all over the world that up until now have not had enough data. So look for the May issue of Bioscience and, and, and read this paper. It's really, it's fairly technical, but really fascinating. So if you have ideas, for uh, papers, you can talk to me about them if you're interested in trying to publish in biosciences. Also, biological conservation, the editor there, um, oh, who knows his name, it just went right out of my head. He was Abe Miller Rushing's major professor at Boston <laughs> University, and he and Abe did the work at Walden Pond where they were able to show climate change by comparing results from now to 100 years ago help me out, it'll come to me. Anyway, again, very, very friendly to citizen science. What about this idea of these data informing science and conservation policy? So I was talking before about how these local projects, like water quality projects, have the opportunity to do this, but the big data collection projects do too. So go back to Eber for a minute. Um, what we're looking at here is a map of California. That's a state to the west of here. In New York, I sometimes do have to explain what California is. Um, and what you're looking at here are map, is a map from eBird data showing you um, where some of the eBird, well, first of all, this is showing you where refuge complexes are, where there's protected land. And what we can do is we can overlay maps from eBird on this, and we can figure out what the gap is. We can figure out where in California it's absolutely essential that the land be flooded at certain times of the year for migratory waterfowl when you inhale. And then working with the Nature Conservancy, what we've done is a reverse auction with the farmers there, in which we actually pay them to flood their land instead of growing rice. And the farmers really don't care where the money's coming. And the birds now have a place to land and refuel, and then as soon as the birds are gone, they drain it and they plant their rice. It's worth it. We drain the As a matter of fact, it worked out so well that we got into the New York Times with this particular project. But back at the local level, citizen science also can really have a big impact on, uh, on local uh, policy. So here's a really famous project, a really famous um, incident that just happened a couple of years ago in uh, Tunnel 1 in New York, which is near uh, Buffalo. And the residents really did feel sick. They thought there was something wrong with our air. So they went to a group called the Buffalo Brigade, which is a, a group that works around the country supplying residents with low-cost sensors for air and water monitoring. And the Bucket Brigade outfitted these folks with air pollution monitors. They went out, they collected the data, they had it analyzed by the Bucket Brigade scientists, and it was way, way above well, well, that one. So they sent them information to the EPA. The EPA looked at it and said, whoa, really? And they sent EPA scientists in, they redid the studies, they corroborated what the citizens had found, and it resulted in changes being made in Tonawanda in terms of smokestacks and locations and, and other uh, regulations around the emissions in that area. All because these folks took it into their own hands, but because they had some the department where they could go to the bucket brigade and get scientific help. Um, if you're more interested in the um, correlation between citizen science and conservation, I really urge you to take a look at this issue of a journal called Issues in Ecology. Investing in citizen science can improve natural resource management and environmental protection. Um, all you have to do is Google citizen science issues in ecology and write up for you it's open access. Um, this is a project that a whole team of people put together targeted specifically for agency heads to help them understand the importance and the significance of citizen science in conservation. It's a real easy read and I think important. Okay, but then what about this achieving educational outcomes? So theoretically we are here at a meeting of the Informal Science Education Network. Theoretically, you are all more interested in the educational outcome than any of the other, right? 
that's my justification for having a lot more slides about education than I did about the other one. Okay, so a few things that I, that I want to say here. We know that citizen science experiences are education. We know that for a large, in a large number of ways. We have a lot of ways of getting that information. One is that people just simply tell us. In the old days, they wrote us letters. And now they send us emails, or they get on list series. And they say things like this, I've learned a lot about bird behavior. Taking part in the project increased my thirst for knowledge. It was fun and educational. Now, those are anecdotes. They're not really data. Some people will say the plural of anecdote is not data, and I say, really, why not? But, you know, this is just incidental information coming in from some participants, but when you get a lot of it, you begin to get the idea of people are really having their lives changed by participating in these projects. And that is how, really, um, at the lab of ornithology, we really galvanized this whole citizen science movement by going to the National Science Foundation in about 1990 and saying, look, we have a lot of information that people's lives are being changed. We think that if we can really build intentionally designed projects with specifically uh, measurable educational outcomes, then you should give us uh, $897,000 <laughs> to do this. And thankfully, Barbara Butler was the program officer at the time, and I saw that earlier here, because if sometimes people call me the father of citizen science, which I do, do, don't deserve, she's kind of like in some ways the mother of citizen science because she was right there at NSF, and it's not like you know, it was good reviews that went along with the proposal. But Barbara really, really saw in the, in the early days of the venture and helped us to receive it. was even the one set by me for that one. My thousand dollars, and that was what really launched this whole series of projects that we got at the Lab of Ornithology. We all to, to really achieve educational outcomes because this is the informal science education part of NSF. And so this really started us off on a long journey of trying to understand what do we mean by education? How do we design projects to achieve these outcomes? What are the outcomes that we're actually trying to achieve? In the earliest days, people would put out a project let's say, a nest box project, not our nest box project, but a nest box project. And they would say, okay, we think the kids are going to learn about the environment from participating in this thing. And then at the end of the project, they'd give them a test, and the test would ask them about recycling. And they would get the answers wrong, and the conclusion would be they didn't learn anything from this project. I am not kidding. <laughs> I'm serious. And so the whole idea of trying to bring some sense to the field and really trying to say, look, you've got to design the project for a specific set of outcomes and you have to have evaluation tools to measure what you're trying to accomplish. It, it, it's really been a long, hard haul starting back in 1990. Now, in 2009 or so, probably 2008, there were a fair number of citizen science projects that had been developed at that point, mostly with NSF funding, and there were a few evaluations starting to and the Center for the Advancement of Informal Science Education asked me to get a group of people together to try to find out, are people learning anything? Well, that's a huge question. I mean, about what? Right? But we had something to start with because right in 2007 or 2008, Alan Friedman, um, who had been the director of the New York Hall of Science, um, had come out with something which are variously known as the NSF Framework for Evaluation of Friedman Indicators. And here they are. Engagement, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behavior. Okay, well, we're still talking about giant buckets, but at least we've got something to start with. So what we did was we put together a rubric, a matrix, call it what you will, but we started to break those topics down into things that you could consider as potential outcomes for citizen science and measure. And the matrix can be found in our report, which you can get to by just Googling case citizen science on the annual on the whole thing right there. Or you can buy our book, but it's too expensive. So go buy. So we began to understand that by applying this rubric retroactively to these project evaluations, we were beginning to find instances of knowledge gain, environmental attitude change, and such. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. Yeah, we're not 
we're not even like a better quarter of the But <laughs> that was really important, which makes perfect sense to anybody who thinks about education, was that different kinds of projects gave you different kinds of outcomes, depending on the degree to which the participants were involved in the whole process of science. So this is a, a true typo typology or typography of citizen science published in 2009 in that case report, which is really caught on. So the idea is that in a contributory project like Ebert, all the folks are doing is collecting and analyzing samples. And in Ebert, they're really just collecting data and sending it in. And they're learning that they're learning certain things. Whereas in what we call the collaborative project, where the participants are involved in a greater spectrum of activity, there are a different set of things that they're learning. And if they're in a co-creative project, which is sometimes called community science, maybe even helping to, maybe even coming up with the idea for the project, they're going to learn yet another set of skills and outcomes. So for example, who, has anybody here heard the great back of your account? Oh, wow, everybody. I could say, is anybody not? You can hold up your hands and embarrass yourself. But, so the great back of your account um, starts this Tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. The Great Backyard Bird Count is funded by the National Science Foundation. Surprise, surprise. Um, and here's a funny story that I'll tell you about the Great Backyard Bird Count. Uh, I'll tell you about. Uh, I'm tell you anyway. So we started the Great Backyard Bird Count not actually get bird data, but actually to see if the internet would work to collect bird data. That's really the reason that we started it. And the idea was, okay, the internet really ought to work because they can all the stuff that we've been doing online, the feeder watch, the scan of the forms, people would fill in their form with their number two pencil, they would send it to us. This was faster than anything that had ever happened before. It was still pretty slow, but with the internet, you get the answers back just like that. And so that's why we started the Great Backyard Bird Count. And it's become so popular, we can't turn it off. So it continues to this day. Now, that's not to say it's not important. It is very, very important. The data that come from the Great Backyard Bird Count are usually get news and some in our study. But because we've got Ebert. And if we're going to answer a question, then we're just going to go straight to the Ebert. But the Great Backyard Bird Count is an amazing education tool for getting uh, families and kids involved in citizen science. It's the biggest feeder that we have for Eber. You know, it's you know, it's like a little drug, right? They, they do it for a weekend, it's a lot of fun and it's an Eber. So, but now, if you participate in the great backyard bird count, there are some things that we know that you will learn because we've done pre and post testing surveys. You'll learn to identify more species. Uh, we'll understand bird population diversity and we'll see interesting behaviors. Use data analysis to a lot of people do this. But if you're involved in the Salal Harvest Sustainability Study, which was run by a colleague of mine named Heidi Ballard, um, who's now a professor at the University of California at Davis, where she involved 25 um, workers in trying to figure out how to sustainably harvest Salal, which is an undergrowth ornamental in the Pacific Northwest. These folks really, really depended on the Salal for their livelihood, and they had to learn how to not over harvest it and they work with her to understand this plant and how to harvest it. And look what they learned. They learned to collect field data. They learned how science is conducted because they were involved in setting up the experiment. They actually improved the relationships that they had as harvesters with the forest managers from the forest service. Really, really cool. Um, another project, another very famous one, from Tillery, North Carolina, Community Health Effects of Industrial Hog Operation. It was a lot like what happened in Conawanda with the um, air pollution project, where they went out into the community. I just don't have time to describe the whole thing to you, but they went out into the community and they learned how to take data on their own health uh, on different days. And this, this um, also culminated in changing regulations about where our farms could be located. And here, these folks had an increased awareness of how human health and air quality issues uh, interact. They were involved in policy change. They realized that their communities were becoming empowered. Very, very powerful learning. Is this better learning than GBBC? No. It's just different. It's a different project. It's a different audience. It's a different outcome. 
are there ways of doing things with eBird so that we can begin to develop and use the eBird platform for community science so that all kinds of learning can happen? Yes, there are, and that's one of the futures of citizen science, is beginning to learn how to blend these models together. This is the informal science education. <coughs> so I'm not going to talk very much about formal learning right now, other than to say it is easier to evaluate when you have captive kids in a classroom. Uh, and teachers who are willing to participate. Um, but I fear that I'm not going to finish it as well on that right now. Before I move on to the, the final phase of this talk, I do want to uh, mention a project that was funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, and one of the things that we realized when we put together that report for case with the Center for the Advancement of Informal Science Education was that there was a real dirt of quality evaluation tools for citizen science. In fact, there's a real dirt of them for the whole informal science education field. And so we used that case report as the basis for a grant proposal to say, give us, now it's $2 million. And what we will do is we will put together a whole series of validated evaluation instruments that anybody with training can use to evaluate educational outcomes from citizen science. And we wanted to come up with this online toolkit. Um, and I'm not going to go all the way through this toolkit right now, but what I think it's all online. But what I will tell you is that this important wheel amounts to going back to the Friedman framework and redoing the constructs, but this time starting in the field. So we went onto the web and we looked at all the goals and objectives for every single science project that had a website. We surveyed the field. We used our own experience at the lab of ornithology. And we identified these six constructs as those that project leaders and participants are most interested in achieving or gaining through citizen science. We defined them very, very carefully. And then we developed evaluation tools to measure them and tested them and tested them and tested them and tested them. And at this point, um, most of the device scales are ready. And you can get them for free, download them. Um, and I'll show you another slide at the end of the talk that'll show you where you can go to get them. But I think something that's really important about this is not just that we have these evaluation tools that you can measure the outcome, but what, that we can find the potential possible outcome. So now, when somebody writes a proposal to NSF, and they say, well, we're going to measure environmental behavior. And they don't break it down. They say specifically what they need. They're not going to get funded. Because they could have gone and they could have looked at these constructs, which were built across the entire field. That's both, that's both, a, um, that's both a, a tip and a warning. Um, and so we just came up with a paper just a couple months ago in the journal Public Understanding of Science. And I would urge you to read this one. Um, again, just Google Public Understanding of Science, Citizen Science, or come right to this. I would urge you to read this one because I believe it is the most comprehensive review so far published of all of the known learning outcomes from citizens. I mean, there are probably been a few more since we took the paper, but right? it's pretty comprehensive. Um, Pretty easy to read. Okay, so finally, on to the intentional design. What time is it? Do I need to sing again? Wait for a while. Okay, a little bit more time. Intentional design. You can't just throw out a project and expect it to come up with good data or an informed conservation policy or to have measurable objectives. You have to know what you're doing and design it very, very carefully. So, that brings us to why I'm actually up here. Why am I standing in front of you? Well, it's because I've been doing this for 30 some odd years and been standing on the shoulders of this guy here, Arthur Allen, who's the founder of the Lab of Ornithology. And although I never met him, he died a few years before I got to him now. Absolutely one of my heroes. So he was the first professor of ornithology in the world. He was at Cornell University. He was in the entomology department. So it wasn't a lot of college. And after he finished his degree on memory blackbirds, they said he they hired him as a professor of ornithology in the entomology department. 
And he went to the entomology chair one day and said, this is really weird. I study birds and you study bugs. And the guy said, ah, call yourself a lab of ornithology. So he hung a sign on his door knob and said, a lab of ornithology, and that is how the lab started. 100 years ago this year, we just celebrated our centennial. And Arthur Allen, I could do, I have a whole lecture on the history of the lab, but I don't have time to give you. Allen went on to revolutionize and galvanize the field of ornithology. He started the field of, um, he, he started the business of stalking birds with the camera, which in those days was just as cutting edge as a lot of the new internet technology is now. He began bird song recording. He trained graduate students that went on to populate most of the important ornithology programs around the country now, uh, in California, at Harvard, at LSU. But he always connected with the public. That is Arthur Allen going out one afternoon with the Campus Bird Club. This was his passion. He said, our support, we have to stay in touch with, with the public. We're an interdependent. And that led, in 1965, to starting the Nest Record Card Program, which was one of the first organized citizen science projects, and the first one that the lab of one did. I knew about that project when I was a kid. Um, and as I told you, and as I told you all over lunch, my parents took my whole family out. Um, they took us out of school, so that parents did not let school interfere with our education. And, um, here, as us, here we are at Hawk Mountain one time. And so this real abiding interest in birds and ornithology and this early experience of my father getting me to collect my own data and my knowledge that the lab knew this citizen science, but it wasn't called that, is what led me to the lab of ornithology as a student in 1972. Now, I never knew that I would still be there how many more years after that. Nor did the lab look like this in 1972. That's our current building now, which is 12 years old. But um, I'm not going to tell you my whole boring history either, but I was fortunate to be at the lab uh, in 1983. I came back to the lab full time, and I was fortunate to be there to, to start all the research and science projects. Along the way, I was promoted to director of education, which is when I wrote the first NSF proposal, and then um, later on to director of citizen science, who named it that, and now to director of public engagement and science and so on and so forth. But I got to design all these projects, which is to tell you, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to designing citizen science projects, because I've designed more of them than anybody else in the world, I'm pretty sure at this point. Now, in 2001, I was really, really, really excited about citizen science and where we've gotten to, but we still didn't have the killer project. We had the feeder watch, we had the nest watch project, we had classroom feeder watch, and one day I went to do a, 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 a site visit in Orlando, and it was March, which was a nice time to be in Orlando, and I was out with the kids, and we were watching the theater. Oh, look, there goes a the rosy, it's food, though. I can't count it, not in the theater anymore. And this kept happening. I said, we need a program where anybody can report any dirty, anywhere, any kind, any place. So I went back to the lab, and I said to the folks, there's all these burgers with shoe boxes full of data. We've got to give them a place to put this information. And that's where the idea for eBird came up in around 2000. I think we launched it in 2002. And so at this point, eBird has, can you read that in the back of the room? I don't know if you read that. But it's just big and it's really, really successful. Over 100 peer reviewed publications. And it's used every other year for the state of the birds. But the reason it's successful is because we follow the components of successful project design. And we didn't have this chart set out in front of us. We actually kind of developed this as we went along. And if you want this, I can also tell you where to find this. Just go to the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council website and click on Citizen Science and you can find out there. Um, but I'm just going to really, really quickly tell you a little bit about why Hebrew is successful in how we follow the steps of program design, and then I'll be quiet. And if there's anybody still awake, you can ask questions. So let's say you saw a Kestrel in downtown Albuquerque. Um, you would go in and you'd say, I'm in Albuquerque. Or if you had your smartphone, you would just turn on the keyboard out there, or you in Albuquerque. And you would click in and you would get, say, I want to submit um, 
I submit an observation and it would come up with this thing here. And it would say, what kind of observation are you, are you submitting? Is it traveling? Is it stationary? Is it historical? Which is how people actually put their shoebox in the hands. Or is it incidental? Did you just happen to see something? Yeah, I happen to see a kestrel. I want to put it in here. So then I would put in, I was just one of me, and I would put in what time it was, and I would post it there. And it would give me this list. But this is the list tailored to Albuquerque on February 11th, 2015. Um, which has been curated by the regional editor. Regional editor doesn't like to be in the room. I don't know who we wanted to survey, but there are hundreds of regional editors all around the country who are monitoring these lists and these filters and making sure they're accurate and up to date. So it only has, it doesn't have um, uh, Eastern Phoebe on it because you're not going to see an Eastern Phoebe in Albuquerque. It doesn't have birds that you wouldn't see in February. And when you put in your American Kestrel, if you want to, you can click on a button that will allow you to put in its picture or to put in its sound and send all that information to us as well. That's a fairly long feature. And then in this case, um, there's this one other really important button. Now, if you're just doing an incidental sighting, you, you, Eber knows that you're not recording all the birds you saw or birds. It knows you're just going to put a bird in. But if you said that you're doing a traveling count, it asks you this question, are you reporting all the birds you saw or heard? And that's a really critically important question. Now, if this was a teacher workshop, I'd make you figure out why. But the answer is, if you say yes, then we know that if there's a bird on, if there's a bird you didn't check off, you didn't see it. So we also know it was absent. I mean, or at least I'm detecting the body. That's really critical in the case. And so, <laughs> by having the regional editors and the filters, um, we avoid problems like that. <laughs> and the regional editors can change the filters at any time. So if suddenly Eastern Phoebe's move in here to, to uh, Albuquerque in February, the regional editor can change that. <coughs> and if you saw one and you were sure of it and you reported it, the regional editor would get in touch with you and ask you for a picture of collaboration. So you, if you could move it, you could edit it. So when people say, well, what about quality control? I say to them, well, what about your quality control as one scientist or one graduate student compared to what we have here with hundreds of regional editors filtering this data and thousands and thousands of very expert amateur editors? Now, why do people do it? Well, some of them do it because they actually really want to help birds and help science. Some of them do it because they want a free way to keep their life list backed up on our servers and triplicate forever. Or three, so that you can have your office list, your yard list, your vacation list, and you can compare them year after year with charts and maps and graphs of your data, of your neighbor's data, answer all kinds of questions, track the spread of, of a bird as it, as it increases its range north of the climate change. These are all possible for free with all of these tools that we make available on the bird. Some other people do it because they're part of a project that has a map that has a um, a portal on the bird, like Louisiana Bird Atlas eater. We use the eater platform to build this for the state of Louisiana. Or if you're in Mexico, you go to this website here, it's all in Spanish. So people are comfortable going to the portal that is speaking to them. Uh, when, I wanted, when I was in Australia last summer, um, I, I was really fortunate to be able to go there to the Australian Citizens Science Association and argue on meeting. And I had an extra day in Canberra, and I wanted to see the most birds that I could find. And so I used the bird to tell me where to go, and it sent me to the Black Mountain Nature Reserve, which was walking distance, and I had an up-to-date bird check before I even got there. And I was able to find pretty much all the birds that were on this list. And you can do that anywhere in the world in that for free with the eBird. Plus, as I said, we now have an app, all free. And this is really good for us, because people never make location here, but we need an app. And all of the data are available for free to anybody who requests them, as long as they put in a request and we can track them, so that we can go back and find out later how they're using the data and what became of it. As a matter of fact, we just did a survey of how people were using eBird data over the last five years and found out that uh, hundreds of them are using eBird for conservation purposes in local areas. Um, and that article about that is going to be the lead article in the special issue of biological conservation about citizen science. It's going to be coming out really, really soon. So anybody who wants to, you don't have to be a lab of ornithology scientist, anybody who wants to go down over data and write a paper, 
here's what he did. I don't know who these folks are, but I'm really glad they used this Eber data to write this paper about citizen science or Eber revealing the impacts of climate change on birds. That's Alan Gilbert. That was retrieved from the University. Right. Well, we're next to it. Okay. I don't see anybody nodded off. <laughs> so I don't have to say yet. And I'll just finish up with a few last slides here about going forward with the field. There are hundreds of projects. There are thousands of projects. Some of them are really good. It's in the wrong and as we're going to go forward with this field, and as we're going to convince policymakers and scientists, members of people in the government that citizen science is credible and worthy and important, we need as a field to maintain the very, very highest standards of credibility. And so, there's a few things that we're doing to build the field of citizen science. One, we started the Citizen Science Association. We now have over 4,000 members. I think it's probably closer to 5,000 at this point. Um, it's free to join at this point, and um, we have a really wonderful newsletter that goes out about every month, and we are going to engage very, very deeply in professional development, both um, traveling around putting on workshops for professionals who want to learn how to develop citizen science projects and webinars. And we have a website, www.citizenscience.org. It used to be run by the lab, but we signed an MOU with the Citizen Science Association. So it's now officially the website of the association. We're in the middle of that transition right now. Um, we started a journal called Citizen Science Theory and Practice. The first issue will have 10 articles. It will be out, I think, in March. Um, Five of the articles are in layout right now, and the other five in various other states. But these are articles not about the scientific outcomes of citizen science, because those articles belong in ecology and science, in, 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 all, in all the other professional science journals. But this is articles about how to do it, what are its impacts, how to build and grow the field. For example, one article in the first issue is about using embedded assessment as an analysis tool for it. I happen to be the editor of the journal, so if you're interested in submitting, you can talk to me about that. We're going to have conferences every other year. Our first one was last year in association with AAAS in um, what that, San Jose, California. But the next one's going to be at the Museum of Science in, um, in Raleigh next February. Plans are well underway for that. Incidentally, there are two other citizen science associations, the Australian Citizen Science Association, which had its inaugural meeting last July, which I got to go to. The European Citizen Science Association, which is having its inaugural meeting in May, which we will get to go to. Um, and we have board members in common. We have an MOU. We're all working together. It's really, really exciting. We've been publishing materials, like we have a data management guide that was put together under the auspices of Data One, which is run by the commissioner, who's a professor at UNM. Many of you probably don't know. We have a primer for data policies. It was also put together um, through the uh, ages of data one. Uh, now, this is really, really important. Um, in order to really, really have an impact with citizen science, we need to make sure that citizen science involves all audiences, not just audiences that at this point are typically involved in such things as collecting data for either. And this does not mean that we're saying that there are a lot of audiences that are underserved and need to be taught something. It is not at all what we're saying. What we're saying is that there are a lot of audiences that have something to offer us as scientists and educators. They have important ways of thinking and looking at the world. And that includes indigenous cultures, all kinds of minority cultures. Um, uh, one really, really quick little story here. Um, which I told at lunch, I'll make it really, really short. Um, I was recently asked from my colleague, colleague Jennifer Schreck, to help the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council to put together a citizen science program for the Southern Atlantic Oceans. This is um, really important because the SAFMC sets all the regulations for harvest, um, sanctuaries, no, no fishing zones for spawning, and that sort of thing. 
And the key audience that we're working with here are the fishermen. And so the first day of this conference, we spent entirely saying to the fishermen, it's your ocean. You're the ones out there fishing. You know where the fish are. You know what the problems are. Tell us what we need to spike. Now, there's oceans going to hell, and we're going to tell you fishermen what the catch and how to do it. The other way around, because they are the ones with the knowledge to really the best of interest. This is what absolutely has to happen for citizen science to go for. And even know what the issues and the concerns are for all populations of the world. And that's what this guy is. Um, I told you before about the device project. If you go to citizenscience.org, you can download all those guides that I just told you about. You can get a link where you can request our evaluation guide and also all of the live instruments. And then the last thing that I would say, in case you didn't know, is that citizen science at this point has caught the attention of President Obama and his advisor and all of the leading agencies in resource management. It was a big day last September at the White House. Um, a whole lot of things happened that day. I can't even begin to explain or describe all of them. But one of them was that John Holder issued a memo saying that all the federal agencies needed to appoint a citizen science coordinator within 90 days, which I guess is probably about up now. And most of them have, and I know who a lot of them are, and they're really working together with the association, which is really, really exciting. So recently, when I wanted to talk to the chief scientist of NOAA, and it took a phone call and I got him to his office to talk to him about how NOAA would be involved in citizen science. And he was way ahead. He had already read our stuff. He knew exactly what he wanted to do. This is great insight. Another thing that happened was that the director of NSF um, that day um, talked about how NSF was going to begin putting resources specifically into citizen science, not just, yeah, you can, you can ask for money for citizen science, but we're targeting citizen science. And if you look at the press release that went out with the NSF budget request just about two days ago, the last bullet on there is about funding specifically for citizen science. It doesn't establish anything like a directorate or anything yet, but it does say supplements, eager, rapid, early exploration, we're ready for the project. This is really, really big. But another thing we need to worry about is this federal involvement going to be really great for because right now the field is growing. So I always end with this slide here because these are my kids. That's all. <laughs>